Hello. Well, I'm delighted to introduce the next session to you. Anybody who has worked or cared for children, anybody who has children themselves, or anybody who themselves were once a child understands the enormous amount of development that occurs between infancy and adulthood. Our experiences modulate and modulate how we form and who we become. Nowhere is this more evident than the brain, which maintains some mechanisms of development into adulthood to allow ongoing adaptation and plasticity. Today, we will hear from a spectacularly talented group of scientists who have elucidated the effects of experience in infancy and childhood on the body and the brain, discovered ways to use exercise to heal the brain for children whose development was interrupted by cancer, and, and who have uncovered fundamental mechanisms of learning and adapting. We're going to begin this panel with a keynote address by Matthew Gilman. Dr. Gilman is a professor and director of the obesity program in the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Medical School. His research interests include early life prevention of chronic disease, including obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and asthma. Individual and policy level interventions to prevent obesity and its consequences, and childhood cardiovascular risk factors. He directs Project Viva, an NIH-funded cohort study of pregnant women and their offspring focusing on effects of gestational diet and other factors on outcomes of pregnancy and childhood. He has served in leadership roles in the U.S. National Children's Study, the International Society for Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, the American Heart Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'd like to welcome Dr. Gilman. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, especially coming from a place where it's a lot colder and a lot snowier. I understand you're having drought, but to me it looks really beautiful, so thanks. So my story today begins with David Barker. You know, with uh, pluck and serendipity and a lot of perseverance against prevailing wisdom, he almost solely is responsible for the emergence of a new research paradigm which is now called Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. And this paradigm emphasizes the prenatal period and early childhood as important for the development of health and disease over a lifetime. And teleologically, it makes sense that our early developmental plastic periods have a lifetime of consequence, here depicted as the majority of cell divisions that happen within the first thousand days. And the theory is that if we can intervene at a time that's early and plastic, that we can get on trajectories of health that are better than if we don't intervene. And that if we try to intervene later, it's more difficult because there's an inadequate response to new challenges. So that's the theory. Now let's go back 20 years. I was invited to, for the BMJ, review David Barker's first book for the lay public. And at that point, I was skeptical. I said, okay, here comes a new paradigm. But in the grip of an enthusiast, one must be wary. I talked about biases and confounding, and the fact that I didn't think that uh, David Barker's uh, arguments at that point were persuasive. But even in the following five years, there was an explosion of research that was interdisciplinary that mm, related population-level research with experimental animal models, clinical studies, in vitro studies. And so by five years later, my colleague Janet Rich Edwards and I said, we approached the field of fetal origins of adult disease as skeptics. As one of us said, some of us were rooting for the null hypothesis for the first time in our lives. But with the recent publication of epidemiologic studies that have started to overcome the flaws of the initial work, we've become reluctant converts. Now, if we forward ahead 15 years, we have journal articles, we have journals, we have magazines, we have books for the public, we have books that are uh, for academic audiences, we have a society with increasing membership called the International Society for Dohad. We're on our ninth International Congress. The next one is occurring this fall in Cape Town, South Africa. And we've been able to take more traditional views of life course health, which talk about the diminution of function in adulthood leading to disabilities. And we've said that early life is also important in, in characterizing these trajectories and determining which kind of disability we have late in life. And in this life course perspective, we've also been able to 
not only take your life and your life uh, prenatally, but also talk about your mother's and father's life going back generations and your child's and your grandchildren's life going forward. So this is our life course perspective. So then the question is, in 2015, if all the scientific activity has happened, why has there been so little impact on practice and health policy? And maybe it's because we're barkering up the wrong tree. Um, when, we, uh, when we think about how, how policy decisions are made, there are lots of things that go into it. And you can see a number of these elements in this circle. If we have the wrong evidence, then we're not going to be having evidence-based policies, and maybe the wrong policies will ensue, or maybe no policies. And the idea is, how do we get the evidence to be central in our decisions about practice and policy? So today, I want to talk about that, and I want to give some examples about how we can improve etiologic research, how we can use the science of prediction, talk about risk-benefit analyses, a bit about implementation of interventions, um, long-term effects, which are, of course, very important here, and finally talk about evaluation of policies. And I aim to be an equal opportunity stone thrower, so I'll throw stones at our own epidemiologic kind of research as well as others. And I'd like to begin by throwing stones at my colleagues who do animal, whole, whole animal experiments that are mostly on the physiological basis. So how could animal experiments be more helpful? Well, first of all, why do animal experiments in developmental origins? Well, if you're like me and you start a cohort study, the cohort study has to outlive me to be maximally useful. But if you work with ma uh, rats or mice, which have a lifespan of, at most, five years, probably mostly less, you can go through several lifetimes. And that's really an advantage. And in fact, animal models have shown that this perinatal programming of adult, adult health outcomes exists. And by programming, we mean that some perturbation or a cue at a critical or a sensitive period of development causes alterations with lifelong, sometimes irreversible consequences. So we have classic animal experiments like this, the couch potato rat. So this rat is produced by undernourishing the mother, reducing calories, and by giving the rat after birth a cafeteria diet ad lib. So we'd have this combination of undernourishment before birth, overnourishment afterwards, and you get a rat that's sedentary, that doesn't do physical activity, that's hyperphagic, hyperglycemic, has high blood pressure. This is also what Hales and Barker called the thrifty phenotype. A restriction before birth followed by a surfeit after birth gives us the worst physiology. Um, there's some other classic animal experiments in this field. Here we have two identical twins. So these mice have the same genotype. They're clearly really different in their phenotype. One's yellow and fat and cancer prone and doesn't live very long, and the other one's brown and thin and lives for a long time. So what's the difference between these two? It's their epigenotype. So just by altering the amount of methyl donors that the mother gets around the time of conception, DNA methylation is altered, and you get these wildly different phenotypes. So animal experiments are good for exposures, for timing, for mechanisms, for effects on outcomes. They've proved the programming principle. They've shown this thrifty phenotype hypothesis of the untoward consequences of the combination of prenatal restriction and postnatal surfeit. So what's not to like? Well, if you look at the animal experimental literature, we find that often missing are the basic things that we do in human experiments. Source population, sampling frame, eligibility criteria, recruitment and retention rates, blinding, intention to treat analyses, attention to missing data, and cluster methods. Here's an example. Maternal high-fat diet has now become a rather common paradigm in the developmental origins of health disease. Um, and a few years ago, these authors tried to do a systematic review of animal models of maternal high-fat feeding and offspring glycemic control. They reviewed 1,483 studies, only 11 met their criteria, and among those 11, because of the criteria I showed you on the previous slide and other reasons, the quality scores were low. Not only that, there was a large variability in maternal diet. Some were hypocaloric, others hypercaloric, others not stated, but none were isocaloric. And there was a wide range of fat and carbohydrate content, so you really can't tell what a high-fat diet means. <laughs> 
that different postnatal feeding regimens, different ages of outcome, different outcome assessments, it's impossible to summarize or, an or meta-analyze those data. Another way that animal experiments can be useful in this field is go back to what they were a few years ago. And I showed you this sort of interdisciplinary, multidirectional uh, communication. Right now, a lot of animal experimenters have their own paradigm and go deeper and deeper into that and forget to translate back up to the things that are important for humans. And so there are very few animal studies that look at the issues on this slide, which are really important to health today. So, my view is that animal studies should harmonize interventions and measures. I didn't mention, but there's an importance of publishing null results and translating up. Well, we're not so great in human population studies either. We've got our advantages and disadvantages. And in developmental origins, a lot of the studies that we have come from cohort studies. Observational studies have a big problem, and that's confounding. Randomized controlled trials are meant to minimize confounding, and they have some other advantages, but randomized controlled trials have their disadvantages as well. Since confounding is such a big issue in observational cohort studies, why aren't we doing more to overcome it? To do the things we know get, get us closer to causal reasoning. Many of them are listed on this slide. More judicious multivariable approaches, sub-pair designs, cohorts with different confounding structures, long-term follow-ups of randomized trials, Mendelian randomization, biomarkers, and quasi-experimental studies. Each of these has strengths and weaknesses. We can't just look at one approach. We need to, um, to, to uh, consider them together as a basis for judging evidence. Here's an example, breastfeeding and childhood obesity. So for a long time, there's been a hypothesis that having been breastfed may reduce the risk of childhood obesity and obesity throughout the life course. And there are two major hypotheses. One has to do with the components of breast milk, that there might be hormones that are programming appetite. And the other is a behavioral approach, that um, mother-child dyads who breastfeed, the child learns more about self-regulation of energy intake growing up. But there might also be confounding, because the same sociocultural factors that lead to a decision to breastfeed may be the same ones that are associated with obesity. And besides, fast growing babies may wean, so-called reverse causality. Now, when we published this study from the Growing Up Today study uh, in 2001, there was a lot of hope that longer duration of breastfeeding would actually reduce the risk of obesity. And here you can see this association between longer duration of breastfeeding and a lower risk of overweight in adolescence. Ten years later, I was asked to review this uh, field for the International Journal of Epidemiology, and I took the opportunity to do a scorecard in which I summarized the evidence for and against the hypothesis that having been breastfed reduces the risk of obesity. And at that point, you can see that there were a number of different kinds of studies available. There was early follow-up of a cluster randomized controlled trial. We had a number of cohort studies in developed world, fewer in the developing world and racial ethnic minorities, the SIB pair analyses, different confounding structures, reverse causality, uh, biological effects, behavioral effects, and an ecological analysis. And what you can see on this slide is there's somewhat equal entries in each of these columns for yes, maybe, and no. I don't know if that's the best way to summarize these data. But in any case, I wound up being on the fence at that point. But this was before we published the, the most recent uh, data from the PROBIT study. PROBIT is a cluster randomized controlled trial in the Republic of Belarus, which randomized hospitals to the baby-friendly hospital initiative or usual care. There were 31 hospitals, and follow-up at 11 and a half years involved about 80% of the participants. And what you can see is that breastfeeding promotion did not reduce adiposity at this age of 11 and a half years. If you look on the left-hand part of the slide, you can see the differences in body mass index, fat mass index, fat-free mass index. On the right-hand slide, it's the odds ratio for either overweight or obesity. And there's certainly no evidence of reduction. In fact, if anything, there's evidence of harm. So in breastfeeding and obesity, earlier studies suggested considerable protection. More recent studies cast a lot of doubt through this range of study designs. And PROBIT is a very important study because it not only is a good test of causality, but it can also test the effect of this baby-friendly hospital initiative policy. Here's another example. Um, Dr. Guttbacher raised um, the um, 
the sort of hot issue of epigenetics. So we're looking at epigenetics in Project Viva, which was mentioned before as the cohort study that I run in the Boston area where we recruited women in pregnancy and we're following their kids over time. And we're interested in looking at prenatal exposures, DNA methylation in cord blood, DNA methylation later in childhood as relates to adiposity and metabolic consequences. And on the bottom, you can see we have a discovery, a validation, and a replication. So to put it more simply, we have an exposure, an intermediate, and a health outcome. Prenatal factors, epigenetics, health outcomes. So what is the role of studies like this in policy relevant evidence? So we have this intermediate, DNA methylation, between pre- and perinatal exposures and obesity-related outcomes. So for one thing, epigenetics becomes a surrogate outcome. That makes studies more feasible. We don't have to have as long-term studies. But I have to say that in the, in the new field of omics and even in precision medicine, there's this move towards providing signatures for prediction. In fact, the term biomarker now means something about prediction rather than a more generic term. But we have to remember that prediction has a high bar of proof. For prediction to be useful, there needs to be a high sensitivity and specificity, not just a modest elevation of relative risk. We're used to thinking of relative risks in the order of two or three as strong. But to make good screening tests, relative risks, risks often have to be in the, in the order of magnitude of 200 or 300. And besides, this is a medical model. It's all about individual risk. And as Dr. Guttmacher uh, pointed out, a lot of this is in the service of developing pharmaceuticals with drug targets. But are we really in the business of developing drugs for pregnant women and infants? Probably not so much. And the other thing is if we really go to the extreme in this individual risk, we'll wind up with messages like this, epigenetics warning, what you could eat today could harm the health of your children and your grandchildren. So how is a pregnant woman who already is very concerned about her fetus, supposed to take this kind of message and turn it into positive behavior change. And this is why Sarah Richardson, uh, among other, uh, with a bunch of co-authors, including myself, published this paper in Nature last year saying, let's not blame the mothers. So if we're not gonna blame the mothers, which, well, actually I have another blame the mother slide that you might like. So I blame you for everything, whose fault is that? Those of you who have teenagers may recognize this. So if we're, not gonna, um, if we're not gonna do that, why do we do epigenetics? Because it's elucidating a mechanism. And by the way, the best definition I've ever heard about, of mechanism is from Tom Insel, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He said, a mechanism is one level of reductionism more than you work in. That's the definition of a mechanism. Um, so why do we look for mechanisms in developmental origins? It's because we want biological plausibility for causation. This goes back to the classic definitions of causality by Bradford Hill some 50 years ago. And these become a rationale for primordial prevention. And by primordial prevention, we're talking about optimizing socio-behavior milieus starting at conception or before. We're trying to avoid maternal obesity, excess weight gain, gestational diabetes, smoking in the first place. And it's not necessarily primarily a medical model. In fact, um, Clyde Hertzman and Tom Boyce think about epigenetics as a way to characterize how societal variables embed themselves in biology irrespective of behavior. Epigen experiences get under the skin early in life that affect the course of human development. Epigenetic regulation is the best example of operating principles relevant to biological embedding of societal influences. I also think that there's a way to communicate between science and policymakers in which mechanisms that aren't too deep are good, um, uh, are acceptable and easy ways to communicate. And I think epigenetics is that, at that right archaeological level to motivate how pre- and perinatal, perinatal factors may affect chronic disease over the life course. So, um, for example, even I can understand that after conception, there's a massive uh, demethylation of our genome and over the ensuing weeks and months, methylation comes back at different rates in different tissues. That's why our liver cells are different from our brain cells. And I can also understand why the fat yellow mouse is different from the brown skinny mouse. So I mentioned prediction a minute ago. When can prediction be useful? So uh, we published this paper uh, just over a year ago, 
using Project Viva data. And what we did was we took two prenatal factors and two postnatal factors that have often been related to obesity. We dichotomized them for simplicity. And we said, okay, what if you have the optimal levels of these risk factors? Your mother didn't smoke, gained less weight, <coughs> breastfed you for less than 12 months, and you were a good sleeper. The predicted probability of obesity at age seven years is 4%. On the other hand, if you had the adverse level of these factors, your mother smoked, gained excessively, didn't breastfeed you as long, poorer sleeper, and the predicted probability is 28%. And this slide shows all 16 combinations of those factors, the 4%, the 28%. And if you do a population attributable risk percent calculation, you get 20 to 50%, depending on where you put the cut point. So the easy thing to say is, okay, if you ameliorated these four risk factors, you'd save 20 to 50% of childhood obesity. But of course, that depends on the assumptions of causality and modifiability. That's why we do interventions. And the implication is that multiple risk factor interventions hold promise for preventing obesity. And that's what a number of interventions are testing right now. So prediction can quantify the overall benefit of intervening early and may be able to distinguish the most important determinants that may vary by population and subgroup. Just a few minutes about risk benefit analyses. So we often look at one exposure and one outcome. But in reality, there are multiple exposures and multiple outcomes. So rapid weight gain in infancy, in many studies, is associated with later obesity and cardiovascular consequences. But remember that weight is composed of both linear growth and adiposity growth. There, we might be interested in multiple outcomes, neurocognition in addition to obesity and, and cardiovascular disease. And we have both full-term and preterm infants. So Mandy brown Brelfort and I, a couple years ago, published this review in which we looked at these features. We had healthy AGA full-terms, preterms, and SGA infants. We looked at these two outcomes, and we separated it into linear growth and gr gain in weight for length, a proxy for adiposity. You can see on this slide that there are a lot of question marks for linear growth. In our rush to obesity, we sort of forgot about that, um, that element of growth. Um, and you can also see that in the preterm, in all of them, a gain in weight for length is associated with obesity. But in the preterms, a gain in weight for length is also associated with better neurocognition. So we need to know the balance. Here's another example, fish intake during pregnancy. My colleague Emily Oaken has worked in this space for about 10 years. And the question is, what kind of fish should pregnant women eat? It's complex because we have nutritional benefit. We have toxicant risks like mercury. We have ecologic concerns over fishing and economic influences. Fish is more expensive. And there are a lot of complexities within and across these, uh, these elements. Here's from Project Viva, um, one uh, indication of benefit. Uh, the more omega-3 fatty acids in the maternal diet or in the blood of the mom or in the cord blood, the lower the obesity rate several years later. But you also have the harms for shame. Pregnant eating fish, think of the baby. Um, and Emily was able to look a couple years ago at 19 published seafood consumption guides and calculators, and seeing whether they covered this general population perspective, contaminants, benefits, ecological, and economic influence. As you can see, none of them covers all five of these influences. And so you wind up with recommendations like, eat up to 12 ounces a week of variety of fish, and from another organization, consume a minimum of 12 ounces of seafood per week. So risk-benefit analyses have to take account of multiple exposures, outcomes, and scenarios, and they really help with establishing guidelines. Uh, just a word on interventions. Most interventions in the DOHAD space have been efficacy interventions, so very highly controlled uh, circumstances. I just want to make a comment about how we need to focus on implementation, the upstream effects for effectiveness, sustainability, and dissemination. Um, and now there are a number of whole-of-community approaches to obesity prevention that really work at higher levels of the socio-ecological ladder, and they focus on environment and policy. And in a rather new uh, study that I'm working on collaboratively with a number of national and international investigators, we're looking at this upstream intervention uh, uh, element. We're trying to ask what works for whom and under what circumstances for zero to five-year-olds in community-based obesity prevention. 
And as I said, we're focusing upstream. We're, we're thinking about how do stakeholders relate to each other and how do these relationships lead to effective implementation. And the way we're doing this, and I can come back in a couple months when I have some more information to tell you exactly how it works, is we're applying computational system science simulation modeling, specifically agent-based modeling, to two completed interventions, one in the US called Shape Up Somerville, one in Australia with the better name of Romp and Chomp. Um, we're, uh, uh, we're doing uh, an iterative process with community members to refine the model with an ongoing cluster randomized controlled trial in Australia, and then come back and design a new intervention for under fives called Shape Up Under Five. Long-term effects. Well, I just mentioned simulation modeling. And in developmental origins, we need to know about long-term effects. We want to know effectiveness, safety, cost, cost effectiveness. The only way I know to integrate from multiple sources is simulation modeling. Now, this example is not from earlier, that much earlier in the life course. This is about cost effectiveness of blood pressure screening in adolescents, which we published a few years ago. And in this, we took a two-stage model structure. There already exists a, a coronary heart disease policy model which takes risk factor distributions at age 35 and over time talks about the risks and costs of developing disease and either um, going on to death or uh, having the disease for a long time or uh, recovering. That's a Markov model. And what we were able to do is take information that we and others had produced about blood pressure tracking, prediction, screening, and treatment from age 15 to 35 and hook them on together. And we asked several screen and treat and population strategy questions. We compared different strategies. And we applied this to a baseline cohort of 15-year-old adolescents. And the bottom line is that we found that population-wide policy approaches are both more effective and less costly than any of the screen and treat strategies. And as you know, everyone's supposed to measure blood pressure in, in um, pediatric care um, in routine child visits. But this study suggests that that might not be a useful strategy. Instead, what about a salt reduction campaign, which is a really an, envir an environmental and policy in intervention? Finally, just a couple of words about policy evaluation, natural experiments. This is actually the first study we ever published from Project Viva. It goes back to the fish story. Uh, Emily Oaken was the first author. And we were lucky that the recruitment into Project Viva straddled the first federal mercury warning that came out in 2001. And so we were able to look at fish intake both before and after the warnings. And you can see in the top blue line that the intake of all fish was actually probably going up before the warnings, right after the warnings, which were not a really strong, strongly implemented intervention. They were promulgated through the media, and there might have been posters in obstetricians' offices. So it was a, you know, a modest intervention. But right after this intervention, there was a drop in fish intake, and the slope was downward over the next year. So the good news here is that with not a very strong intervention, pregnant women may be able to change their behavior. They really care about the health of their fetuses. The bad news is this was the wrong thing to change. Um, and then more recently, we've looked at uh, associations of tobacco control policies. Um, Summer Hawkins was a postdoc working with me. And we looked at uh, all births from 28 states and DC between 2000 and 2010 and found that increases in cigarette tax are associated with improved health outcomes related to smoking, and it was just among the highest risk mothers. It was among those with low education. So in conclusion, to achieve evidence-based policies and their implementation, I think animal studies should have more consistent methods, harmonization of designs and measures. In our own studies of epidemiology, we need to combine observational intervention studies. We need to use innovative designs and analyses. We need to compare and combine across studies. Um, we need to use epigenetics um, and other mechanisms like that, not only as um, our, um, our influences on the kind of interventions we do, but also communication with policymakers. Prediction models, I think, are useful for potential intervention targets and to identify those. We really have to be careful about risk stratification. Risk-benefit estimates are good to inform guidelines. We need to move beyond efficacy and intervention to talk about implementation. Long-term simulation models are excellent, especially for cost-effectiveness, and evaluation of current policies for impact. So while good evidence is not sufficient to make sound policy, it sure is helpful. And later, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>